world news tonight. Russia strikes. Russia continues attacks in Ukraine for the second consecutive night in response to the Ukraine Red Crimea bridge attack. Stormed over. Demonstrators stormed the Swedish embassy in Iraq over alleged plan of a Quran burning in Stockholm, Sweden. New normal. Experts announced that soaring temperatures will be the new normal as planet reels under extreme weather. Raw and fireworks. Auckland skies celebrate the opening of the Women's World Cup with mesmerizing fireworks. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are watching World News. We start off tonight in Ukraine as Russian President Vladimir Putin stays true to his vows of revenge with continuous attacks on Ukraine and what could be interpreted as the first video of Yevgeny Prigozhin after that failed march on Moscow. A hellish night. That's how Ukrainian officials describe yet another Russian barrage raining down on the coastal city of Odessa. Of the 63 missiles and drones launched, 26 punched through Ukrainian defenses. Civilians caught in the destruction, but grain infrastructure seems Putin's main target. Moscow has suspended the deal that allows grain to leave Ukrainian ports and today delivered its most sinister warning yet, saying all ships sailing in the Black Sea to Ukrainian ports will be considered as potential carriers of military cargo. That is potentially a full naval blockade on Ukraine if the Kremlin acts on its threats. This is the first video emerges of what appears to be Yevgeny Prigozhin since he staged a failed coup against Putin last month. The dimly lit images match Prigozhin's voice and profile as he addresses Wagner fighters in Belarus, hinting that his forces might rejoin the war at some point, but not anytime soon. Manipur women were being stripped and paraded, drawing condemnation from the indigenous tribal leaders' forum as evidence of heinous atrocities. Slow but steady, India moves ahead with getting justice to victims of abuse. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. More than two months after two women were stripped and paraded by a mob in violent city Maripur, police said that they have registered a case of gang rape and abduction and would soon make arrests. It is amongst the first cases of sexual violence to be reported after the clashes started in the Manipur state of India. The video showing two women being paraded naked by a mob in the violent city northeastern state of Manipur has sparked outrage in India. The horrific video was widely shared on social media and shows them being dragged and groped by a mob of men who then pushed them into a field. The Indigenous Tribal Leaders Forum said that the atrocities had been committed in a village in Kangpokpi. The Indigenous Tribal Leaders Forum said that the atrocities had been committed in a village in Kangpokpi district against women from the Kukizo tribal community. They also alleged that the women had been gang raped. Police say that the assault of the women took months prior but made national headlines recently after the video resurfaced and started going viral on social media. Media. The federal government has asked all social media companies to delete the video from their platforms. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who finally breaking his silence on Manipur more than two months after the violence began, said that the incident had shamed India and that no guilty will be spared. On the other side of the globe, extreme heat waves are sweeping the US and Europe. Experts warn the scorching temperatures will become the new normal amid climate change. A massive heat wave is sweeping much of Europe. Parts of Italy, Greece, France and Spain have seen several days of temperatures around 40 degrees Celsius, which has prompted local authorities to issue red alerts. These warnings suggest that the heat poses a threat to not only vulnerable groups, but to everybody. The heat wave is expected to have a negative effect on Europe's busy summer tourist season, with several popular locations in the affected areas either seeing reduced operating hours or closures. Other tourist destinations such as Spain's Canary Islands are even worse off, with thousands being evacuated in La Palma as the ongoing heat wave exacerbates wildfires there. Wildfires are also raging across the continent, including in Greece and the Swiss Alps. The World Meteorological Organization has warned that the heat wave in Europe could continue into August. In the United States, heat alerts are in effect from California to Florida. The brutal hot air remains trapped, baking the southern half of the country because of what's called a heat dome, 
when a high pressure circulation in the atmosphere acts like a dome, trapping the heat. Heat advisories or excessive heat warnings have been issued in 16 states, with the National Weather Service warning that extreme heat and humidity will significantly increase the potential for heat-related illnesses. Actual air temperatures in parts of the southwest are expected to top 49 degrees Celsius, while states along the Gulf Coast and southeast could exceed 44 degrees. In 2021, the global insurance giant Swiss Re released the study looking into the overall impact of climate change on the global economy. The study found that continued disastrous effects of scorching heat waves could bring losses costing as much as 11 to 14 percent of global economic output by 2050. This was based on a scenario where global temperatures rise by as much as 2.6 degrees above pre-industrial levels. U.S. President Joe Biden pushed forward with his so-called bid economics, planned by announcing new measures to tackle anti-competitive practices, adding that consumers were tired of being played for suckers. Folks are tired of being played for suckers. In an ongoing push to aid U.S. consumers, President Joe Biden on Wednesday pressed forward on his so-called Bidenomics initiative by expanding his war on junk fees, going after big firms dominating the rental housing market. Now, I've said this before, I'm a capitalist, but I have no problem with companies making reasonable profits. But it's got to be a fair competition for that to occur. Often just a handful of companies dominate the marketplace. Bidenomics is about increasing competition, not, not stifling competition. When companies have to compete, it means lower prices, fair wages, and more innovation. In the rental housing sector, for example, three of the largest platforms, Zillow, Apartments.com, and AffordableHousing.com, have agreed to disclose total upfront data on rental costs. Biden has pushed similar transparency measures in other industries, eliminating hidden fees and ticket sales for concerts and other entertainment. Three of the biggest airlines have already agreed to scrap fees for children to sit with parents. He is betting that bringing down costs for Americans will convince voters to give him a second term in the White House. With all of this coming as a Reuters Ipsos poll suggests once gloomy Americans are beginning to see bright spots in the future. A significant share of voters, 36 percent, said they expect their personal economic situation to improve next year, compared with 20 percent who expect it to be weaker. The biggest share, 38 percent said they expect things to stay about the same, and the rest said they did not know. On to the latest on the U.S. service member who crossed into North Korea. He is believed to be in custody, but North Korea remains unresponsive to Washington's calls to verify his status. According to U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller on Wednesday, the U.S. continues to reach out to North Korea to try to verify the status of the U.S. soldier who defected to the North, but to no avail. In terms of contacts with foreign governments, yesterday the Pentagon reached out to counterparts in the Korean People's Army. Uh, my understanding is that those, uh, uh, those communications have not yet been answered. The spokesperson says while Washington has a number of channels through which it can contact Pyongyang, he would not go into the details of the matter due to its sensitivity, but added that they have been in contact with their counterparts in South Korea and Sweden, which acts as a diplomatic channel between Washington and Pyongyang. Miller also stressed that both the U.S. and the U.N. are working together to gather information on Private Travis King, including his well-being and whereabouts, adding that Washington will continue to work to ensure his safety and return him home to his family. Meanwhile, a tourist from New Zealand who was on the same tour from which the U.S. soldier defected to North Korea shared her story of what exactly happened on the day. It all happened pretty quickly. Um... I probably only saw him running for like a few seconds and that's all it would have taken um, to get a across the border. And then, you know, a, a couple of seconds after I saw him, that's when the soldiers shouted and started running after him. And then um, and then then they told us to get in the building. So it all it was all a bit of a scramble. And uh, yeah, it all happened very quickly. It still remains a mystery as to how King was able to join the tour, as those wishing to participate usually have to submit their passport information in advance. According to one tour company, King could have booked the tour through a special tour run by the United Service Organizations, an organization dedicated to U.S. service members and family. It added that as the USO operates an information desk at Incheon International Airport, he could have made a last-minute reservation for the tour. 
We'll be back with more world news of this short commercial break. Welcome back. A shooting has left two people dead in the centre of Auckland, New Zealand, hours before the city is due to open the FIFA Women's World Cup. And Prime Minister Chris Hipkins stated that the attack was not being seen as an act of terrorism. At least two people were killed, as well as an armed attacker in a shootout in Auckland, New Zealand's largest city, early Thursday. The violence came hours before the city was due to host the opening match of the Women's Soccer World Cup. Police say the gunman arrived at a construction site with a pump-action shotgun and moved through it floor to floor, firing as he went. When he reached the upper levels, he contained himself within an elevator shaft. Further shots were fired and he was later found dead. A witness described panic as the events unfolded. We were at, right at the entrance and uh, I saw like 20 people rushing out of the building and uh, telling the pedestrians to move, I was like, what happened? And I go ask them, they, see, they say, like, we saw a, a guy with a shotgun in his hand and he was aiming for people. Local TV news captured the moment an injured police officer was escorted onto an ambulance. He's among a number of people who were wounded in the incident. The shooting took place near hotels where soccer teams are staying for the FIFA Women's World Cup tournament, which kicks off Thursday evening at Eden Park. New Zealand Prime Minister Chris Hipkins said there'll be increased police presence. However, he ruled out cancelling the matches altogether. I want to reiterate that there is no wider national security threat. This appears to be the actions of one individual. Auckland, Aucklanders and those watching around the world can be assured that the police have neutralised the threat and that they are not seeking anybody else in relation to the incident. He added police haven't been able to identify any ideological or political reasons for the shooter's actions. Gun violence is rare in New Zealand. The country saw its worst peacetime mass shooting in 2019, when a shooter, a suspected white supremacist, killed 51 Muslim worshippers in Christchurch. The government responded then with swift gun reform. All military-style semi-automatics were banned, and a gun registry was launched last month. Over in Iraq, protesters stormed the main gates of the Swedish embassy in Baghdad in response to police in Stockholm granting permission for a demonstration where organizers were reportedly planning another burning of the Muslim holy book, the Quran. Hundreds of people stormed the Swedish embassy in Baghdad in the early hours of Thursday, setting it on fire in protest at the expected burning of the Quran in Sweden. The demonstration was called by supporters of Shiite cleric Muqtada Sadh, according to posts in a telegram group linked to the cleric. Sadh is one of Iraq's most powerful figures, who commands hundreds of thousands of followers. Eyewitness video showed demonstrators carrying his portrait and chanting pro sadh slogans. The Swedish foreign ministry said all embassy staff were safe and condemned the attack. Iraq's foreign ministry issued a similar condemnation, vowing to conduct a swift investigation to identify the perpetrators and hold them to account. The protest was staged after Swedish police on Wednesday granted an application for a public meeting outside the Iraqi embassy in Stockholm. Police said in the permit, two people were expected to participate. According to local reports, the two planned to burn the Quran and the Iraqi flag at the public meeting and included a man who previously set a Quran on fire outside a Stockholm mosque. That action in June sparked massive protests in several Muslim countries, including Iraq, with Baghdad seeking the man's extradition to face trial in the country. The United States also condemned it, but added that Sweden's issuing of the permit supported freedom of expression and was not an endorsement of the action. Hundreds of Israeli reservists marched in Tel Alvil, threatening to refuse their volunteer service if the government presses ahead with its controversial plan to curb the power of the Supreme Court. Hundreds of Israeli reservists joined protests on Wednesday against the government's judicial reforms. Many of them signed a petition vowing to refuse service if the new legislation passes. Others dropped refusal notices into ballot boxes. 
we feel we're doing the right thing and that we are fighting for the democracy of Israel. This act that we are doing is to defend the democracy and we feel that we, the, the reservists, are always the first to defend Israel. I came here today to sign, to convey the message that I will not serve a dictator, I will not serve in a dictatorship. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's drive to strip the Supreme Court of some of its review powers has triggered months of mass protests across Israel. Proponents of the changes say the court has become too interventionist and that the change will facilitate effective governance. Opponents say the court has a critical role in protecting civil rights and liberties. This latest action by reservists, who are from some of the military's most elite formations, has caused particular concern. Defence chiefs are worried that the protests risk compromising national security. The conscript military draws on reserves in wartime and requires that they undergo regular training. The Israeli military declined to comment. Tesla chief executive Elon Musk says the electric card maker could continue to cut prices as the world economy is in turbulent times. The multi-billionaire's comments came after the company reported that its profit margins had been squeezed as it faced tough competition. Tesla CEO Elon Musk signaled on Wednesday that he would slash prices again on the company's vehicles. On an earnings call with analysts, Musk said, quote, One day, it seems like the world economy is falling apart. Next day, it's fine. I don't know what the hell is going on. We're in, I would call it, turbulent times. Tesla shares fell nearly 5% after the call. To price out competitors in the US, China, and other key markets, Tesla has slashed prices several times since late last year, by as much as a quarter on some of its models. Though the cuts have squeezed the company's gross margins, a closely watched indicator in the industry, on the same call, Musk doubled down on his earlier assertion that Tesla would sacrifice margins to boost vehicle production. The company did complete a record 466,000 vehicle deliveries globally between April and July. But Tesla's quarterly gross margin during that same period, regulatory credits aside, fell to around 18% according to calculations. That's a far cry from the 26% it reported for the same period in 2022, and the lowest for Tesla in four years. In a statement, Tesla reiterated its plan to deliver 1.8 million vehicles this year, but acknowledged that production would drop in the third quarter due to factory upgrades. Welcome back. For more news, let's take it on the world in a minute. The EU's top diplomat, Joseph Borrell, asserts Russian attackers on grain storage facilities in Ukrainian ports, days after announcing its withdrawal from the UN broker deal to ensure supply will prompt a huge food crisis. Rescue workers in India battle difficult terrain and bad weather as they search for more than 100 people fear trapped in a landslide that killed at least 10 villages after incessant rain soaked a mountain slope. Chinese scientists have revealed a new and larger breed of moret, a type of edible fungus popular in China, that was brought back by the country's Shenzhou 12 main space mission crew. Australian and Irish supporters, both draped in green and gold, have come together for a sellout crowd of 70,000, a record attendance for a women's soccer match in Australia. Meta Platform said it was working to resolve WhatsApp connectivity issues after thousands of users globally reported problems accessing the messaging app. More than 177,000 users reported issues with WhatsApp in the United Kingdom and nearly 15,000 said they have faced trouble while using the messaging app in India. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with views of firework painting the night sky in New Zealand, kicking off the FIFA Women's World Cup. Thank you for watching. Good night.